the Grove Church, we love celebrating baptisms. We never get tired of seeing life change, and baptism is the outward expression of someone's inward decision to follow Jesus. I wonder if that's your next step. If you're interested in baptism or you think that it might be your turn, then I want you to scan the QR code below. See, we believe that baptism is a great opportunity for the church to celebrate what God is doing, saving people. And to be honest, it's why we do everything that we do. It's why we serve. It's why we give our first and best. It's why we plant churches. It's why we reach others. It's why we serve our community. It's why we cultivate faith is to see others fall in love with Jesus. If it's your turn to take that step of baptism, scan this QR code and we can't wait to celebrate it with you. Good morning, church. I'm Pastor Blake, and I want to welcome you this morning. If this is your first time with us or your first time in a while, we are so thankful you decided to spend your Sunday morning with us. You may have noticed some commotion in the lobby when you came in, and that's because today is Cinco de Dippo, Nacho Average Dip Competition. So we want you to go around, sample all those incredible dips, then help us vote to determine which is the best of the best. Now, before we fill you in on some more announcements, I want to let you know how much we value connecting with you. So inside of the program you receive, you'll find a connection card. We want to encourage you to fill that out so that we know how we can connect best with you, be praying for you, and be celebrating with you. If it's your first time visiting us, we also have a gift for you. So please, as you drop off your connection card on your way out, make sure you stop by the Welcome Center so we can meet you and give you that gift. Now, check out these announcements. I want to remind you that Mother's Day is next Sunday on May 12th. It's going to be a huge day of celebration here at The Grove, where we're going to be honoring all the women who have made such an impact on our lives. We're also going to be celebrating parent commissioning that day. So invite someone to join you and get ready to celebrate. Grove Church, thank you for giving your first and best. It's because of your generosity that we're able to reach our community, serve others, and share the love of Jesus. We have a few simple and secure ways to give. You can go online to our website or the Grove Church app, or you can fill out the envelope in your program and drop it off in one of the giving boxes on your way out. Thank you for your continued generosity. You're my summer day, sweet like lemon. Nay, it gets hot, but you still throwing shade. And you might be a face, but it, it's okay, cause you're my summer day. You're my summer day. As someone who um, who really really hated college, <laughs> just because of the process, these are the first set of classes that I like don't fall asleep in. That I'm constantly asking the teacher questions, and I think it's done in a way that really kind of like simplifies what you're reading. It gives you great context and depth to scripture that you've probably already read. The spring semester has been one of the most life changing things for me as of late. I would definitely encourage you to come back for the fall semester. I'll be here. Good morning. Good morning. 
Have you guys ever been uh, like on the mountaintop? Let me, let me say it this way to the Floridians. <laughs> Have you ever been like everything going great? Like the experience where you just won the game, maybe you won the prize or the bride, like everything was smooth. You were in the fast lane and cruise control. Everything was good. And then all of a sudden, a crash. Someone comes out of nowhere and kind of knocks you out of that lane and spins you in circles on 95 in the middle of the night. Maybe, maybe you wreck somehow physically, or maybe more of our wrecks look a lot more like emotionally and spiritually. You guys ever been there? Where everything was just going right. It was like a really good day, a really good night. And then all of a sudden, the next day, you wake up in a funk. You wake up in a low, you wake up in the valley that you wondered, how did I go from the mountaintop to the low? I think why is because we all struggle with these things called emotions. And we're kicking off a new series today called Under the Hood. And I want to encourage you to come back uh, for the next four more weeks as we look through these emotions and how they affect our life. Why is it under the hood? Because simply this, when you go to crank your car in the morning and all those beautiful yellow and red and orange lights turn on, they're not supposed to be there. If you're like me, we've learned to embrace ABS or whatever that is. And the little engine light, I've always just thought that it reminds me that my truck has an engine, right? So I thought it's supposed to be there, but like when they flash and let you know, they let you know something's not right. Well, just like that in our own life, emotions can't diagnose our issues. But what our emotions do is they let us know that there's an issue inside each one of us. And I believe God's given us these emotions so that they, like the lights, are warning lights to our crashes or to our lows. And I just want to encourage you to come back and see what God's word says and how God's word has us to deal with things like this, anxiety. I would never ask you to raise your hand if you struggle with anxiety because that would instantly cause anxiety. But there's a lot of us that struggle with anxiety. Your, your, your heart just elevated right now because I said the A word in church, right? Uh, emotions like worry or grief, anger or jealousy. And today I want to look at this idea of depression and loneliness. And what does the Bible have to say or what does the Bible deal with when we're in severe depression or we're in a place that we would consider to be lonely? You know, today, um, major depression is one of the most common mental disorders in the United States. It says this, 8% of adults in America, that's roughly 21 million adults from the ages of 18 to 25, have had one or more major depressive episodes this last year. Now, a major depressive episode is simply this, that your depression, your sadness, your loneliness, it lasts more than two weeks. And it includes some of these following symptoms, depressed mood, loss of interest or pleasure in daily activities, Specific symptoms such as disruption with sleep, eating, energy, concentration, and then here's the kicker for you, self-worth. 21 million Americans this last year in 2023 had a major depressive episode. That's not like the little dumps. That's not like the feel like, man, I'm having a bad day. I must not be worth much. Or, gosh, I can't sleep good tonight. I'm not really hungry tomorrow. Like, no, these are issues that last more than two weeks. 21 million Americans. And if we're honest, there's probably some of us sitting right now in this room who are in this same category right now today. But I want you to know this, hear this loud and clear. If you hear nothing more, hear this. You're not alone. You're not alone. If you go to the ages of 12 to 17, they estimate that over 5 million adolescents have had a depressive episode lasting more than two weeks. But here's the crazy part. It increases now to 21%, from 8% to 21% that adolescents or population ages 12 to 17 are struggling mentally with their self-worth and their desires to achieve something greater than themselves. These symptoms or these numbers don't count those of us struggling that are not being seen by a doctor. Because if we're real, Uh, There's many of us that grew up in families or maybe grew up in the church where we were taught that depression is something you just pray out and we've never sought help, but we really need to seek some help. Uh, Many of us believe that if we just uh, try harder, it'll go away. Here's the reality. I believe there's an enemy prowling around like a roaring lion ready to devour you. I don't say that to frighten you. I just say that to say this is what the scripture tells us. 
that we're in a spiritual war and we're battling against all kind of spiritual enemies. And one of those is if they can take control of your thoughts, they can, can take control of what you feel about yourself or the darkness that you're going to place yourself in, they win. That's why the Bible tells us to take every thought captive and make it obedient to Christ. That's why the Bible tells us in John chapter 8 to get out of the darkness and walk with who? Walk with Jesus in the light. Because he knows that these things are trying to tear us and pull us away. And uh, I'll just be real right off the rip. Uh, sin doesn't just make you bad. Sin doesn't just make you dirty or trap you up. Sin kills you. It eliminates you from relationship with God. And depression in no way is that sin. It's not the sin of depression. But depression leads you to dark places where that isolation and that loneliness, it leads to annihilation. Where you pull yourself so far outside of community and so far from others that are actually speaking truth and giving hope that you go into such a dark place, you're separated from anyone and everyone around you that loves you enough to tell you the truth. So in no way, hear this, your depression, your isolation, your loneliness, that's not a sin. But it's that emotion that leads us to furthering ourselves away from the Father that causes sin in our life. And we must do something about it. Look at the idea of loneliness. When we talk about loneliness or feeling alone, one in four adults would say they often feel lonely. So just look right now on your row. There's on every single row, there's four people somewhere on that row. There's one of you in the four right now feel lonely and let you're in a crowded room. And as we go through crowds, as we go through stores, as we go through work, like you can be around people all the time, yet you still feel disconnected and lonely. 47% feel left out. 47% of adults in America today would say that they feel left out, maybe left out from the family gatherings. Some of you are thankful for that. You want to be left out from those family <laughs> gatherings. So don't blow the whistle, all right? Don't ruin the good that you have. But there is people who legit feel left out. They feel left out of work gatherings. They feel left out of neighborhood hangouts, like 47%. Guys, that's, uh, I'm not a mathematician here, okay? I'm a magician, but that's almost half. Half of the room feels like they're left out. This one really wrecked me though. It says that 18% of people have someone to call in a time of need. 18% of people. That's 82% of people say they have no one to call in a time of need. I just experienced that myself. Last week had to call family and friends at 2.30 in the morning because I was in a wreck and everyone answered. Just kidding, no one answered, right? <laughs> The FHP is like, sir, you're going to have to leave the side of 95. The car is being towed. And I was like, sir, I promise someone's going to answer. I am loved by many. <laughs> and he's like, it's not looking like it, sir. 18% <laughs> of people say they have someone to call in a time of need. 82% of us feel like when I call, no one answers. Guys, loneliness and depression is a real thing. It's crazy to me to think that we have more opportunity to connect both physically and digitally. Yet in many ways, we we completely feel disconnected more today than ever before. We have a device in our pockets at all times that connect worldwide, yet we feel more disconnected than we ever did before we had these. Why is that? I simply believe this. It's not a new concept. Depression and loneliness isn't new. Uh, matter of fact, I want to look at a story of isolation, a story of great depression, of loneliness that reminds us that you are not alone. This story is in the Old Testament in 1 Kings chapter 19. It shows me that thousand or more years ago, thousands years ago, uh, depression was rampant there just like it's rampant today. It's like from the mountaintop to the valleys. There's a, a prophet by the name of Elijah. And Elijah in 1 Kings, if you have a, a Bible or a phone, you can look there. And if I would strongly encourage you to read 1 Kings 18 later on today because it really helps set the scene. But for time's sake, um, here's what happens in 1 Kings 18 is Elijah has this great win. I mean, he has the Super Bowl of prayer. He has the Super Bowl um, of showing that his God's the one true God. And he calls out these 850 prophets of false gods, of prophet of Baal and the prophet of Asher. And um, he has this competition with a sacrifice and um, the building of the altar and the setting fire of the sacrificial um, ram or bull in this case. And um, Elijah calls down uh, fire from heaven and it burns up everything, even including uh, the altar and the sacrifice and the wood and the gallons upon gallons of waters that he put on top of the fire, which I don't know if you built a fire in a long time, but you don't need water to build a fire. But, but he did that. Why? Just to show God would show up and show off. 
And you could call that the greatest win of all times. He was at the highest point, like, like you said you felt before. You've been at the top or the mountaintop experience. But here's what's crazy. As 1 Kings 18 ends and 1 Kings 19 begins, he goes from the highest of highs to the lowest of lows, all in a couple verses. Here's what it says, 1 Kings chapter 19. It says, now Ahab told Jezebel everything Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. So Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah to say, may the gods deal with me. Be it ever so severely, if by this time tomorrow, I do not make your life like that of one of them. Elijah was afraid and ran for his life. When he came to Beersheba in Judah, he left his servant there while he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness. He came to a broom bush, sat down under it and prayed that he might die. I have had enough, Lord. He said, take my life. Am I no better than my ancestors? This is 100% crazy to me to think that Elijah has the greatest win, uh, the, the most satisfaction. Like not only did God show up, God delivered those false prophets to Elijah. He killed all of them. And then everyone that was left bowed and worshiped the one true God, Elijah's God. And then in that place, Elijah just kept telling himself that he was alone. Did you know like Uh, him telling himself over and over and over and over again that he was alone, guess what he felt? Alone. I I think there's a lot of us today that just need to hear this out loud in the group setting is like, you're not alone. You're telling yourself you're alone, but there's people who actually love you, who sleep in the same bed as you, who live on the same hall as you or in the same covering of roof as you. There's, There's people who love you and are just a phone call away. Maybe not at two in the morning, but I promise they love you and they will answer after they wake up at seven. I was already Ubered home by then, but yeah, they, they answer later, right? There's this idea where we tell ourselves we're alone so much that we actually begin to feel alone. Elijah said he was the only prophet. He was the last one, but it's not true. Look right in that passage. It says, as he's traveling back, afraid for his life, he leaves his servant there. He isolated himself from the one that believed in him. And you might read over that and say, Barry, how do you get that? Simply, Elijah says throughout the whole chapter, I'm alone, I'm alone, I'm alone. No, you left your servant behind. I think there's many of us just right now today as we think through this, the first thing we must realize is we're not alone, that there's someone there to be with you. He he goes from the mountaintop experience and complete victory down to find himself in Harry Potter land under the broom bush right? Like he finds himself like trying to find out how do I not live any longer? And again, let's just pause there for a second. This guy's zeal for God was greater than mine and most likely yours. He stood before 850 false prophets and said, my God's real, your God's false. How many of us back down from just one little disagreement yet he was willing to lose his life for the sake of his God? Why? Because he believed him to be true. He was zealous for God. He was willing to sacrifice everything, including his last breath. He loved God. We could say that with everything we have. Elijah loved God. He loved him fully. Yet he found himself with suicidal thoughts. A guy that believed in God so much that he, he prayed a, a bold prayer of God, show the people who you are and they'll all turn to you. And then maybe just hours later, he finds himself saying, God, if that's still you, and if you're still that good, just take my life. It would be better for me to be dead than alive. And he says, I'm worse off than my ancestors. He's saying, I'm worse off than those that have ran from you and fled from you, that didn't believe in you, that didn't agree with you. Like, I'm worse off than them in your eyes. So just take my life now. You know, there's probably some of us in the room that have um, highs and lows a lot like this. And we don't know how we got there. We don't know how just the victory vanished so fast and the darkness crept in so quickly. But we find ourselves in this place and we don't know what we do. So what happens next? Again, you're not alone. Elijah under that bush, he was exhausted. It says a day's journey. I don't know how far you make it a day. I don't know how far you can travel, but I got at least two miles in me, maybe three, right? But he's exhausted a full day's travel. He left his servant behind. He left everything behind and he got it. He's hungry. He's thirsty. He falls down and he falls asleep. And here's what happens next. First Kings 19. Then he lay down under the bush and fell asleep. All at once, an angel touched him and said, get up and eat. 
He looked around and there by his head was some bread baked over hot coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and then he lay down again. Now I'm not a great theologian, um, but I feel like when I read this verse this morning, I realized what most of our problem is right away. I, I literally realized I could solve depression in America today. You ready? Here's the truth. Many of you guys would not receive God's help because you don't want to eat the carbs. Many of you say, I don't do bread. I'm on a diet. It's speedo season and I can't have it. Like you turn away what God offers. Like guys, here's the clue. Go get some crazy bread today. All right, here's the truth. It has nothing to do with bread. <laughs> it has nothing to do with bread or your carbs or your silly diet. It's working. All right, you look great. This, can I tell you that? You look great. You don't want to eat bread. That's fine. I'll take all I can get. Here's the truth of this. God shows up. And when God shows up, everything changes. I don't have a self-help plan for you today to overcome depression. I don't have like a self-help secret for us to get out of isolation, but I know a God. I know a God. And when we invite God into our situations, into our darkness, into our weaknesses, into our depression, into our loneliness, like when God shows up, everything changes. So if you're in that hard place and you're just in a tough spot, here's all I need you to know right now. The first thing you got to do, you got to find a way to get with God. You got to find a way to get with God. Now, Elijah falls asleep under the broom bush. God touches him and provides him with nourishment. Like he's completely exhausted. I think a lot of our depression is that we're running too hard. A lot of our depression is we're not resting the way God told us to rest. We run seven days a week, as many hours as we can get a day. And we say, hey, if we take a nap here, if we take a nap there, like, but we're not resting at all. When's the last time we've pressed pause and just tried to sit with God? I think a lot of us in our life, we think that's lazy. And why would we do that? But the reality is God created the heavens and the earth and he, oh, you guys don't want to admit it. And he rested. God created everything that we see as existence. And then he rested. And then he tells us, hey, do as I did. And we say, no, man, I, it's a hard world to live in God. I got to have a side hustle. So I got to work a second job on top of my full-time job. I got to work a third income when I get a chance, because who knows what the economy is going to do next. So I got to be prepared. And like, we work ourselves to exhaustion, a day's journey in. Elijah finds himself alone by choice. He left the people that was with him. He left his servant back in Judah and he continued to travel on. And he like giddy up, if you know what I mean. He got on it for a day. And then when God found him, he was in his darkest hour, or his lowest lows just after the mountaintop experience, a lot like being in cruise control in the fast lane, everything going great. And out of nowhere, a car hits you in the side. Emotionally or spiritually, we wreck out, we spin out of control and we say, how did we get here? Elijah finds himself in a, how did we get here moment? Um, but here's the truth. Verse 11 and 12, God says, go out and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great and powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. After the wind, there was an earthquake, but the Lord was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, there was a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. You know, I think for a lot of us, we look for God in so many ways. We want God to give us a sign. We want God to like reach down and shake us violently like an earthquake. We want him to, to blow so strong that the things in front of us change, uh, that maybe the, the hardships that we face or the turmoil that's there, like God, just blow it away and give me a fresh start. Uh, sometimes we say, God, like may your fire come. May, may you burn away everything that's not of you and may only the things that stand among the ash is what you want me to be. And like all of these prayers and all these things, we're begging God to show up in these mighty ways. And then God shows up in a whisper. I think the encouragement for us this morning is simply this. How do we get with God? We get with God in the whisper. I believe the Bible's very clear and challenges those of us who know him to get in God, get with God through his word. It's the, it's the gift that was given to us for life. The, the word, the Bible wasn't written to us, but it was written for us. And as it was written for us, it has something for every aspect of life. As a man, there's scripture for you to how to be a godly man. As a woman, how to be a godly woman. As a, a husband and a father and a wife and a mother. Like as a worker, as an employer and an employee. 
uh, and the mountain tops and the valley lows. There's scripture for all of it. And I feel like we want a word from God so bad, but we turn to the word of God last. We want the earthquakes. We want the storms. We want the fires. But in reality, God spoke in the whisper. And that whisper is, think about when you can hear the whisper. It's when you turn down all the other noise. When we turn down the distractions of life, when we turn down social media and its platforms, when we turn down the news, because that's deadly, right? But hearing the news is way worse than what's happening on the news, just so you know that, okay? The political series was over. You missed it. Go back and listen to it. But turn down the news. Turn down the volume. Turn down the people in your life that aren't walking with Jesus. Like, like turn down the things that are pushing you away from God. And then in that silence, God will speak. And he does that readily through the word of God. Uh, Psalms 119, 105. There's so many scriptures about God's word in God's word. But this is one of my absolute favorites. It says, your word is a lamp for my feet and a light on my path. I, I want to hold that verse tight, that this is the, the scripture that guides me. The word of God as a whole, from Genesis to Revelations, like it guides me in my darkness and in my dark hours where I'm in my valley lows. Because uh, just be honest, we all get there. Somehow we go from the mountaintops to the valley lows in an instant. You, you win the, the greatest uh, achievement of your life. And the very next day, you, you're laying under a bush wishing you were dead. How do we get there? I don't know how we get there, but I know how we get out. We get out by getting with God through his word every day. It's sharper than any double-edged sword. It'll cut through joint and marrow. It'll, it'll, it'll pierce all transgressions. Like it's useful for teaching and correcting and training and righteousness. Like, like God's word is enough. It's what we desire. It's what we need. Get into God's word in your dark hour and your hardship. If you don't know how to start, start in John chapter one and just read the book of John today. Read it today. Put, go to you version and press the arrow. It's play. And just put your AirPods in and listen to the word of God. Remember the Bible says, do not just be listeners or hearers of the word of God, but be doers. So as we hear it, as, as we learn to listen to it, may we apply it to our lives. And just like Elijah, you experience the true presence of God when we learn to hear the whisper. The second way we get with God in today's society and every day is through prayer. It's an open line of communication that we pray without ceasing. We, we pray continually. Again, there's, there's hundreds of verses about communicating with the Father. How do we do this? Like Jesus taught us himself, this is how we pray. This is how we approach the throne of grace. But like for you, how is your prayer life? If you're in isolation or you're in depression, like you're in the, the valleys and you find yourself in these, these dark places for days and days on end, how are you praying in those places? How are you communicating with the Father that knows you and loves you? We pray. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6. This is when people come to me with anxiety or worry or darkness or depression or loneliness. This is the scripture I, I push towards. Do not be anxious about anything, but in every situation, by prayer and petition, with thanksgiving, present your request to God. In verse 7, it goes on to say, and the peace of God, which transcends all understandings, will guard your heart and mind in Christ Jesus. The, the end result is the peace of God that you so badly desire. You want that more than anything. When you're in the storm, you want calm. And the way you get to calm is by going through the Father, through prayer and petition. If you're angst or anxious or you have worry, you're, you're lonely, you're scared, you're in fear for your life, a lot like Elijah running, we go to God, we get with God through his word today. It's a tangible resource for you. And through prayer, and maybe I've heard some of you guys say, man, prayer is a hard thing. God, I, I can't pray like you pray, Barry. Don't worry about how we pray. You pray. Just start off by saying, dear Jesus. And then through that, just whatever comes to your heart. I remember a, a story. I'll give you a quick story. One time about a Bible study. We had a growth group down in Port St. John of men. And I would like just pop out and ask guys how to pray. And uh, I asked this one guy, he was brand new to the church, brand new to a Bible study, bought his first Bible. Really, he like brought one to the study and he was coming to this growth group. And I remember I asked him to pray and he just got pale white. He's about to pass out. And we just stared at him and beep, he dropped the F word. And he said, I just, I'm so nervous, man. I'm so nervous. And I said, hey, it's okay. Just pray. And he prayed and he prayed the most elementary prayer you possibly could pray. And at the very end, he just said, in Jesus name, amen. And when he said, amen, we like started applauding him. 
We started clapping him. When I opened my eyes, he was sweating. He said the F word and was sweating in the Bible study or the growth group. And we applauded him, right? Listen, God, God already knows our sin. Does he approve of it? No, he sent his one and only son to die for it. But man, when you cry out in the name of Jesus, that's all he hears. And he like pushed past that word. He pushed past that awkwardness of the growth group of like other guys looking around like, are you allowed to say that, right? Like, no, you're not supposed to. But here's the truth. His prayer was great. It was his first time. I remember like later on, a couple weeks later, his wife texted me and was like, hey, my husband prayed for our family for the first time. And I was like, hey, did he say? <laughs> hey, that prayer grew him. It matured him. It made him more into the man that God created him to be. Some of you guys don't know how to start. Just don't start with that word. Start with any other word but that. And however you end it, just end it in Jesus' name. And it's good enough. Move on. Learn to pray. Guys, you didn't know how to drive, and then you learned one day how to start. Some of y'all still don't, but you're practicing. (laughs) Keep practicing. Practice that prayer. It's going to draw you closer to the one that knows you and loves you. These are all steps that we take. But here's the truth. The first step that you must take is a relationship with Jesus. You can't get to God or get with God unless you go through his son. For John 14, 6 says, he's the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. And some of you are like, Barry, I've heard about Jesus. I've heard about religion or Christianity, but I just don't know him. Know this, Jesus knows you and he loves you. Jesus knows you and he loves you. All your flaws, all your secrets, the things you hide behind, the things you hide from, he knows you and he still loves you. And here's what he wants you to know is simply this. When God created you, he created you for community. He created you for a relationship with the Father and with Jesus, so much so that he was willing to die in your place. What we say about the gospel is this. We got four parts. God has a perfect plan for you. God created you in perfect relationship with him. And one thing got in the way of that. That's sin. And like I said earlier, sin doesn't just make you bad. It doesn't make you dirty. It doesn't make you gross. No, sin kills you. It separates you from an all-knowing, all-loving God. And if you take sin on for yourself, you'll be eternally separated from the Father. But that's not the end. Because the third part is Jesus died for that sin. Jesus paid the full payment and penalty of our sin, of of my sin and of your sin. And then all you have to do to choose to receive that is receive the gift that's been freely given to you. God had a plan for you. Sin separated you. Jesus died for you. Will you believe that today? That's the gospel. And that's the first step for some of us today. We can't go any further down the road to climb out of depression or walk away from isolation until we get with God in a relationship through his son, the one we call Jesus. And Jesus knows you and he loves you. It's not how much you know about him. It's not the religion that you follow. It's do you know him? Can you call him savior and Lord from a personal confession of your mouth and belief in your heart, Romans tells us. Can you do that? And if you can do that, your next step, and this is the step for everyone in the room, is to get into community. Get into community. Uh, 1 Kings chapter 19, verse 19 through 21, it tells us this story about Elisha, the other prophet who's, who's tending the fields with his oxen, and Elijah runs to Elisha, and he says, hey, come with me. And Elisha jumps off his oxen, and he runs to Elijah. And then he says, wait, 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 wait. Let me go back and kiss my mom and dad. And Elijah's like, you know, you're coming with me or not. Come with me. And Elisha goes back. He kills the oxen. He burns the plows. He takes the oxen and he puts them on the fire and he has a barbecue for his family. He burns the ships. He says, I'm not coming back. I'm not going back. And he, he takes care of the oxen. He takes care of the plows. He kisses mom and dad's. And he says, Elijah, let's go. You're no longer alone for I'm with you. And it's this beautiful picture about community that God created us in and for community. You know, this isn't a new concept. Elisha finding Elisha isn't a new concept. It actually says in the very beginning of the Bible, in Genesis chapter 1, that God created the heavens and the earth, and everything was good. And he goes through the whole creation plan, and then he says, he gets to man, and he says um, that man's alone. It's not good that man's alone. And he says, so what it will do is we're going to create man, humankind, male and female. We're going to create them in our image. You know what God's saying? God's saying from the very beginning, before anything existed, community existed. The Father, 
the Son, and the Spirit. Perfect picture of community. He's never been alone. Think about this. This might blow your theological mind for just a second, but you'll catch it in a minute. Um, God has never been alone. Jesus died on the cross and he says, Father, for why have you forsaken me? It is like God turned his back on Jesus for the moment that he took on all of my sin and, and all of your sin. And he dies for humanity. And Jesus is separated from the Father and the Spirit. But the Father had the Spirit. He had community all along for all of eternity from before and past and present. He's never been alone. And then he creates us in his image and he says, in our image, you were never meant to be alone. And he gave you community. What we must do is get into community. Elijah goes on with Elisha and just the, the word of God continues to spread through the land. Why? Because they're together. They were meant for community. God created us not to do life alone. Or you can say it like this. Doing life alone is deadly. There's an analogy uh, uh, from Dr. Bruce Alexander in the 1970s. Had an experiment, ex experiment that has become known as Rat Park. In this experience, they placed a single rat in a cage with a single food source and two sources of water. The single rat can eat the food whenever he wants. It's always there for him. And there's two bottles of water. One bottle is normal tap water. Titus Phil's finest. The other bottle is tap water laced with cocaine or heroin. Which bottle of water do you think the single rat drinks from? Right. He would be no idiot. He gets high. He drinks from the bottle so much that 100% of the rats overdose and die. When the single rat is in the cage, singular, by himself or by herself, with a bottle laced with drugs, the rat dies every single time. But here's what Dr. Bruce Alexander realizes is he built a larger cage and he called it the rat park. And in the rat park, he built like little toys and objects for the rats to play on and little balls for the rats to push. And he created this community project and he took a pack of rats and he put them in the cage. And church, listen what happens. He puts a single food source, enough for the whole community, and he puts a bottle of water on one side of the cage that's clean tap water and a bottle of water on the other side of the cage, and it's laced with drugs, and he puts the packs of rats in the same cage in the same room. And do you know what happens 99.9% .9 of the time? Almost every single rat throughout the entire year of the experience, when they were in community, chose life. They chose to drink from the clean water. Every now and then, one rogue rat would drink from the drug-laced water. But here's the truth behind this entire st study. Not one rat in community overdosed and died. You know what I'm telling you this morning, church? You need to find your rat pack. You need to find that pack of rats that'll do life with you. You need to find a group of people that'll help you make decisions that lead to life and not death. You know how we do this at the Grove? We do this in a thing called growth groups. Growth groups are our rat packs where we go into small cages with enough food sources to get us through the night and we engage in topical studies or we talk about the Sunday morning uh, messages and we have growth groups where we get to do life together, learning how to choose the water that leads to life. And here's the good news. You don't have to go far to find this growth group. Matter of fact, in just a minute, when I'm gonna pray, you can stand up and you can walk right out those double doors and turn to the left. Find someone with a lanyard on. They are here today to help you find a growth group. They want more than anything for you to find a group that leads to life. That's how you make a big church feel small. Get into community. That's how you get with God is through his word and through prayer. And how do you get out of your dark place? How do you get out of the feeling of isolation or loneliness? Get into community. Find your rat pack. If you would, please stand up with me. I'm going to give you two options. One is if you want to talk more about that relationship with Jesus, you want to hear those four for yourself, that God had a plan for you, sin separated you, Jesus died for you, and will you believe that? I'm going to have some people right up front in just a minute ready to pray with you about that transition from death to life.
And if that's you, don't go any farther. As soon as I start to pray, just come to the front. Let's talk about what Jesus uh, means to you and who he is to you. And the rest of you, if you don't have a growth group and you want a growth group, go out those double doors and turn to the left. Do not dip out. You hear that? Do not dip out until you find community. Find that rat pack. If it's full and occupied, eat some dip while you wait. But don't leave. Find that pack. Either come forward or find a group. Lord Jesus, thank you for who you are. Thank you for knowing us and loving us. God, meet us where we are right now in our darkness, in our deepest valleys, the furthest we are from you. God, help us find you, uh, the one true God. It's in the name of Jesus we pray. Amen. Go in God's grace. Hey there. Thanks so much for watching online with us today. We really hope you enjoyed this service and that the Lord spoke to you exactly where you are. At the Grove Church, we believe that God, the creator of the universe, loves and knows each and every one of us on a personal level. But due to the sin in the world and in our hearts, there's a divide between us and God. Until Christ Jesus came and he died on, a, on the cross for our sins so that we could enter into a relationship with him and walk in a newness of life. If you are ready to learn more about a relationship with Jesus and what it means to get to walk in that newness, please visit the link below. We're praying for you and we hope we see you soon.